Uh, just uh, welcome to our services this morning, both in person and on live on Facebook. We appreciate uh, those watching as well and worshiping with us. Just a couple mentions about the prayer list. Uh, Sam, Sam Spencer, Samantha Spencer was uh, rushed back to the hospital this week, but everything I think is checked out okay. Uh, she was just in some severe pain. And uh, so uh, continue to pray for that situation. She was in an auto accident a couple weeks ago and fractured her, her neck and had to have some emergency surgery. But uh, uh, the prognosis is good at this point, and we continue to uh, pray that that will be the case. Uh, there's been a couple names uh, also added to our prayer list, so make sure you pay attention to those. Uh, B.J. Hall from Kenton has asked for us to be praying for him for some health issues. And then the family of Cora Hokum. Cora passed away on Valentine's Day. Corey and Cora and her late husband, uh, Kenny, attended uh, here for many years here at McGuffey Church of Christ, so she passed away recently, so let's be in prayer for that family. Uh, also, a leadership meeting today uh, will begin 30 minutes after we uh, finish our worship service here this morning. Uh, leadership will be meeting after church. Anything else we need to mention before we uh, begin our worship this morning? If not, stand and I'll open us in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, are just grateful for the opportunity to be here and worship you and and uh, it's just a lot of fun to come and meet others, brothers and sisters in Christ, and just to open our hearts and our minds and just uh, get back on that solid rock of uh, what our purpose in our daily life is, and that's uh, living for, for you and your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we just thank you that we have this opportunity now just to lift our voices and praise and, and hear your word proclaimed that we can uh, learn a little bit more that we can use, that we can apply it to our daily lives. Father, you know what our future is. You already know the rest of our life. Uh, you know you have a plan for it. We just need to be uh, quit talking to ourselves and start talking to you. And it's so we can uh, uh, allow you to lead us and guide us the way that you uh, have plans for us. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity. We just thank you for the blessing. We ask your blessing upon those that uh, lead us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we can. 
Uh, yesterday we had a wonderful day here. Um, somber reason that we're here, but uh, it really felt like the church was coming back again. It was the, the lot of people here that the help. I can't say enough about this congregation of the help that we got yesterday from the the kitchen to the, the staff out here. It was just amazing, and uh, such a such a beautiful thing for you know a neighbor that lives two steps out the door there, and, and so many people from town was here yesterday, and it was great evangelism opportunities, so I can't thank all of you enough for your prayers, your your time, your effort, it's just, it's what the church should be, you know, as a hurting family that the church said, hey, let us let us help you, let us rescue you, and it was, it was I'm just so proud of you, all of you guys, I'm just so happy for you, so uh, thank you again. Um, and, and continue to keep that family in your prayers, the, the John Kearns family. Um, uh, they've got a long road ahead of them, but they, they've got a good family and, and good support unit. So, so they'll, they'll be okay, but they could certainly use your prayers. I was reading where a businessman was late for an appointment, a meeting, and he, and he couldn't find a parking space. And as he frantically circled the block, he got so desperate, he just started, decided to pray. And it's, it's kind of a sad situation. He starts to pray, and he looks up to heaven, and he said, Lord, he said, take pity on me. He said, if you find me a parking space, I'll go to church every Sunday for the rest of my life. Not only that, I'll give up drinking. Miraculously, a parking space appeared. The guy looked up to heaven, and he said, never mind, I found one. We laugh at that, but there are some people in this world and, and this week reminded me of that. This was not what I was supposed to preach this week, but this is what God wants me to preach. But I was reminded that there are people in this world who can't see for looking. The evidence could be as clear as the nose on their face, but they can't see it because they simply refuse to see it. I'm sure most of you have heard of the book called Ripley's Believe It or Not. The man who wrote it enjoyed collecting stories that were unbelievable, but they were true. For example, I was reading a young girl from California once swung 68 hula hoops on her body at the same time. A man, I read a man had a chicken that laid a square egg. I would think that would hurt. The world's largest hot dog was over 3,000 feet long, weighed 885 pounds, and took 103 butchers to carry it. 
Now, these stories are hard to believe, but they're true. Why do I tell you that? Because our Bible has stories in it that are true, even though they're hard to believe at times. For example, Thomas, the disciple, refused to believe the other disciples when they told him that they had seen the risen Savior. He was not with the other disciples in the room when they saw Jesus on that first Easter night. He refused to believe them until he could see Jesus in person himself. One week later, all the disciples, including Thomas, were in the same room when they saw Jesus again. Jesus knew at that time that Thomas needed proof of his resurrection, and he invited Thomas to put his finger in his nail holes and in his hands and the spear hole in his side. And it was only at that time that Thomas was able to believe. He could see it. You know, some people are like that in this day and age. They refuse to believe that Jesus rose from the dead because they've not seen it with their own eyes. They want concrete proof. On the other hand, all of us that know Jesus rose from the dead because we believe it in faith. We don't need to see it with our own eyes. We have a faith in Jesus that he would rise from the dead. I want to talk to you today. I want to talk to you about being wise. I want us as followers of Jesus Christ to be able to see what others don't see or what they don't want to see. I want this body of believers and Christians worldwide to be able to see with the eyes of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. The ability to preach your word, the ability to sing songs to you, the ability to, most importantly, to commune with you. Father, we thank you for that. The small things around here, Lord, we thank you for. People plowing driveways, people serving at, at funeral dinners, people shaking hands and, and cleaning up, and those small things we're so thankful for, God. That's the Acts 2 church. You've showed us that model. We just have to believe it and instill it in our lives. We thank you so much for that. Father, place a hedge of protection around this congregation as we move forward, as we continue with our goal of bringing the community back to the church. Father, help us to be wise. Help us to be able to see what you see. And most importantly, Lord, break our heart for what breaks yours. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible says Jesus was the one who taught with authority. And it amazed crowds because their own teachers did not. The Lord's parable of the wise and the foolish builder, found in Luke 6, 46 and 49, which is not our, 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 our message today, but it is specifically directed to those who profess to follow Jesus. And Jesus begins by asking a simple question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? It is not enough to simply hear the sayings of Christ, but we have to apply them. It should be our heart's desire to obey Christ when we say we accept you as our Lord and Savior. You know, Christ is mocked and scorned when professing Christians call him Lord, Lord, but they don't seek to do his will. Of the wise builder, Jesus says, I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. And, and he goes on and he says, he is like a man building a house who dug deep down and laid the foundation on a rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck the house but could not shake it because it was well built. It had a solid foundation. And we see here that this true believer takes his Christianity seriously. He puts his faith in Christ, the rock of ages. He allows the Holy Spirit to wash his heart clean with the word of God. And he walks in obedience and follows what God says. King David said in Psalms 119, he said, You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. He then says in Psalms 119.9, he says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. And Jesus says, such a man is like the house that can't be shaken by the floodwaters because his faith is resting on the solid foundation. You see, friends, true disciples stand firm when the storms of life rage. Friends, listen to me this morning. Listen to me when I tell you this. No Christian is exempt from sickness, from disappointment, accidents, abuse, 
or any other trauma this world or the devil throws our way. But these storms of life cause true born-again believers in Christ to simply dig deeper into God's word, to pray more, and to stand more firmly on the promise of Christ. One thing this pandemic has done for me, it has really improved my prayer life. But the foolish builder, Jesus says, the one who hears my words and doesn't put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a solid foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and destruction was complete. Now the false disciple lays no foundation in Christ. He ignores the word of God. He applies himself elsewhere. He lets himself get overly busy in worldly matters and does not consider the consequences. He often hears the instructions of the master builder through the local church, through parents, through friends, Christian relatives, radio, books. And day after day, week after week, year after year, he hears them, but he never sees them. That's the question. Can you see with the eyes of Christ? He never actually follows the instructions on how to build a spiritual life. And the firm foundation is never laid. And of this person, the sad part about this, of this person, Jesus said, will say on judgment day, I never knew you. This false disciple falls under the storms of life and eternity. But the true disciple stands firm and lives a life worthy of the gospel he professes, and he reaps eternal life and becomes a very wise Christian and is able to see with the eyes of Christ. So the question this morning is, how can we get to the point where we truly become wise and living a life for Jesus Christ? If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Let's look at the Gospel of Mark. Let's look at the 8th chapter this morning. We're going to look and see where Jesus is working to bring his disciples to the point where they become wise and where they are able to see with the eyes of his. Mark 8, let's look at chapter 11 through 13 is where we'll start this morning. And God's word says this. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for miraculous signs? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back on the boat, and cross the other side. That's the NIV version. Now these, the, the Pharisees were those who thought they had all the answers. And they wanted to put Jesus to the test. But even if Jesus passed the test with flying collars, they weren't going to believe it. They're standing right in front of Jesus, and they're not going to believe it. There's nothing more concrete than the man standing in front of you. Even if Jesus gave them a sign after sign to prove that he is the Lord, they still wouldn't be able to see him for who he was because they didn't want to. He wasn't their idea of a Messiah. The fact is, Jesus had already given them sign after sign. In Mark 1, in one of their synagogues, he cast out a demon. In Mark 2, in their very presence, he healed a paralyzed man. In Mark 3, in another one of their synagogues, he healed a man with a withered hand. In Mark 5, he raised a little girl from dead. In Mark 6, he fed 5,000 men plus wives and children with five rolls and two fish. And, but now, in Mark 8, when Jesus goes back to Israel, the Pharisees ask him for a sign. What do, they need a, what do the Pharisees need a sign for? Jesus had performed many miracles in their presence so far, and they refused to see it. It's not that they can't see, it's they won't see. They simply refuse to recognize Jesus for who he is because they don't want it in their life. What they're saying is, listen, I know it all, so don't confuse me with the facts. And that's why Jesus leaves them without giving them a sign. It wouldn't have done any good to anybody. Proverbs 26.4 says, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. If we want to be truly wise, don't be like the Pharisees refuse to see. In our world, that we, the lives we reach today, we have to show them Jesus in us. 
Let me tell you a story. Pete Lofman is a minister. And, and Pete tells the story of, he's, one time, uh, Pete served a very wealthy congregation as their minister. And over the years, the different members had donated various items to the church, many of which were quite valuable. The stained glass windows were valued at tens of thousands of dollars. The communion table was an intricately carved piece of art from a world-famous artist in Germany. And they had several expensive nativity sets worth thousands of dollars. And the list goes on and on. But the most prized possession of this church was a painting of Jesus' mother Mary given to the church in the 1930s. Now, this was called a Madonna painting. Some of you may have heard of it. It's called a Madonna painting. The painting was housed in a special room in this church that was temperature controlled and very secure. These people even had a small pamphlet made explaining all the possessions in their church when visitors came. What do you think the priority is in that church? Now, unfortunately, a toilet overflowed in the basement and it caused extensive damages downstairs. So this caused the trustees of the church to check the current value of the long list of items the church possessed for insurance purposes. So they get a well-renowned art dealer was contacted to appraise the various works of art in the church. The man appraised the various items in the church and he saved the famous Madonna painting for last as the trustees didn't want the dealer in the room alone with the painting. That's how much they valued this painting. Finally, the time come for the art dealer to appraise the Madonna painting. And the art dealer quietly took the painting down, slowly looked the painting over, and one of the trustees could not contain himself and he blurted out, so how much is it worth, buddy? Well, said the art dealer, I need to give the painting a more detailed examination. But he said, I, I'm, I'm very impressed. My first thought was it was worth maybe, the guy says, maybe seven or $8,000. But then the appraiser says these words. He says, this is the best forgery of a painting I've ever seen. Yeah. Now this clearly agitated the trustees. And the one guy shot back and said, what are you talking about? This painting must be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is no forgery. You don't know what you're talking about. The art dealer didn't miss a beat. And he coolly says, listen, if you don't believe me, you go see this original yourself in the art museum, Metropolitan Museum in New York City. They have the original. Believe it or not, there were some in the congregation who refused to believe the painting was a forgery. Some stepped forward and attempted to stop any form of pay payment to the art dealer saying that he was inept and didn't know what he was talking about. And others set out to find a real art appraiser who would give a true assessment of the painting. Why did I tell you that? Because for years, these people in this church had lived with what they thought was real. Everyone told them the painting was real, then in turn told everyone else the painting was real, and they could, they could not see the painting in any other light. It was real to them. Finally, the consensus was made that the church had the real painting, and the Metropolitan Art Museum had the fake, and to the knowledge of the minister, not one of his congregational members, not one, has ever went to the New York City Art Museum to see the real Madonna because they believe they have the real one. They refuse to believe what they were told and the proof of the original in New York. Don't be like those who don't see, folks. Don't be like those who don't want to be confused with the facts because they think they know it all already. Don't let the world suck you into its ignorance. At the very least, admit your inability to see so Christ can open your eyes. If we want to be truly wise, the second thing we need to do this morning is we don't need, we don't need to be like those who can't see. Don't be like those who have no sense. Don't be like those who have no understanding of who Jesus is. That's where the disciples are at this point in our story. They haven't figured it out yet, but Jesus is going to help them as they get into their boat to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Look at verses 14 and 15. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. 
Now, I want you to imagine this, okay? As the boat leaves the shore at this point on the Sea of Galilee, I'm thinking that the disciples can look back and see Herod's giant palace raising in the sky behind the Pharisees are standing on the shore. Now the disciples are hungry with one, just one bread roll to share between the 13 of them. And perhaps some of them are looking back at the wealth and power of Herod, looking at the Pharisees. Maybe they're longing to be rich and powerful as well. And it's a teachable moment for the disciples, and Jesus takes advantage of it like the master he is. And as they're looking at Herod's palace and the Pharisees standing before it, he warns them to watch out for that kind of yeast. In other words, like yeast which permeates a whole lump of dough, a longing for the outward trapping of success and power can only end up corrupting all of us on the inside. Luke 12, 1 tells us that the yeast of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. It's play acting. It's putting on a show. It's pursuing self-glory. And Jesus warns us that such a pursuit is morally and spiritually destructive. It's a powerful lesson, but the disciples are not thinking about the spiritual lesson. They're thinking about their stomachs. Look at verse 16 and 17. They discuss this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Today we might say, Do you have such a hard head or... Or can I knock some sense into you? Scripture goes on in verses 18 through 21. It says, Do you have eyes but fail to see? And ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousands? How many basketful of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, Seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? These guys can't see it yet. Jesus is Lord. It doesn't matter that they only have one role for 13 people. Jesus can take what they have and use it to meet all their needs as well as our needs today. They don't need the wealth and power of the Pharisees and Herod. They have everything they need in Jesus, but they just can't see it yet. On January 25th, 1979, 35-year-old Willard Boone from a small community south of Columbia, Mississippi, drowned in the Pearl River. True story. Drowned in the Pearl River. During that week, four other people drowned along that path in the Pearl River. A reporter for then, for the Jackson Daily News, quoted a law official as saying, this is one of the most treacherous rivers in the country. People don't realize the danger along the Pearl River. It's just a crying shame so many drown in it. Now I tell you this story because Christ gives us so many warnings about missing out on eternal life. But sadly, in spite of all the Bible says, preachers preach the good news and many still choose to defy the odds and end up in hell. Now, unlike the Pharisees who won't see, the disciples can't see. And sometimes we're like that too. Sometimes we can't see or we forget what we have in Jesus. He provides for us at times and time and time again. And yet with each new challenge, we still worry about having enough resources. As Stan Caffey and his fiance prepared to get married, they cleaned out their respective garages and sold everything to Goodwill. Between the two of them, they sold an assortment of clothes, bicycles, tools, computer parts, and tattered copies of the Declaration of Independence that had been hanging in Stan's garage for 10 years. You know where this is going. Well, when Stan's trash turned out to be another man's treasure, that particular version of the Declaration of Independence was a rare copy made in 1823. A man named Michael Sparks spotted it. He purchased the document from this guy in his garage for $2.48. And then later auctioned it off. You ready? 
$277,000. That's not a bad profit. Listen to this. Later, Kathy, the previous owner, commented, he said, I'm happy for the Sparks guy. If I still had it, it would still be hanging in the garage and I still wouldn't know what it was worth. And that describes a lot of Christians. They like to have Jesus hanging around. But they don't know what he's worth. They don't realize what they have in Jesus Christ. Friends, let's never forget the supreme treasure we have in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. This is way off the subject. I'm not, I, should, I had my uh, funeral sermon done Wednesday. I had some jokes in there. I had some things that never had anything to do with the guy that's laying in the casket. And at 9.30 Friday night, the Lord woke me up. He said, this isn't about you. And I changed that sermon. That's what he'll do for you. He'll say, David, this isn't right. I got a right way. You follow my way. You'll never fail. But sometimes David fails to see, and it ends up causing David problems. If we want to be truly wise, don't be like those who won't see. Don't be like those who can't see. Instead, ask Jesus to help you see. Look at Mark 8, 22 and 24. They came to Bethesda, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Now we see in this passage of scripture that this blind man has some wonderful friends. They know about Jesus. They may have heard him teach as he had traveled from around the areas, I don't know. Perhaps they'd been fed by Jesus from the few loaves and fish, I don't know. But they knew Jesus to be a person of great power, and so they get their blind friend and said, we can help you. We want to open your eyes. Let's go see Jesus. How many times have we been at the hospital? How many times have we been at the funeral home? How many times have we been at the ball game? Somebody comes up to you with a really major life problem. Have you ever said, I know who can help you with that. I fail every day at that. So Jesus took the blind man by the hand. He leads him outside the village. Now I love this verse simply because the verse shows us a clear expression of Jesus. And that's human compassion. He does not authoritatively command the blind man, okay? He doesn't hey, say, hey, come over here. The man couldn't see. He had friends as his guide to bring him to Jesus. And now Jesus takes over and acts as his guide and takes him outside the village. Did Jesus take him outside the village because he didn't, did not wish to see a large crowd running up to him for cures? Or was it in the interest of the blind man himself to make him feel more at ease and able to concentrate all his attention on Jesus? Both are possible. It may also be that Jesus wants to focus personal, direct attention on the person away from the crowd. I believe that because Jesus did the same thing in Mark 7, 23. When some people brought a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, the Bible says Jesus took him away from the crowd. You know, a person who is blind or who is deaf and mute may feel very conspicuous and not wish to be centered out. And Jesus cares enough about that person to take that person aside. And the touch of Jesus as he used saliva and places his hands on the blind man gave the message, it gave the message of human contact. How desperate are we for that this day? We haven't been able to hug. We haven't been able to hold somebody. How desperate are we for that? 
Now, the man couldn't see, but Jesus gave clear indication of his presence. In asking him, he says, do you see anything? Do you see anything? Jesus is, invo- Jesus is involving the blind man in his own cure. Listen, the man is not a passive recipient of Jesus' power. There's a direct communication between Jesus and this man. The man is able to see people, but not clearly. They look like trees walking around, he said. So once more, Jesus touches the man's eyes, and his sight is restored completely. Now, we're not told why there is a two-step process in the healing of this blind man. Maybe the two-step process allowed for gradual adjustments to to sight being restored. Whatever the reason, it's the only time a two-step process is used in the Bible. Look that up. Don't take my word for that. Look that up. Whatever the reason, the man is healed and he can see. And then Jesus tells him not to go to the village. It seems odd. For one thing, Jesus did not perform the miracle in order to draw attention to himself. He never did those things to draw attention to himself. And he did not want this miracle to be an advertisement of his power. But another possibility is that Jesus was showing how much he cared for this man. He was telling him, go home away from the crowds and be with the ones that love you and the ones you love. Can you imagine that reception? John's here. Somebody get the door for him. He came through himself. He tells him to go home to be with his family so he could celebrate and consider the greatness of Jesus and what he had done. Look at verse 25 through 26. Once more, Jesus puts his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. It's a picture of what Jesus' disciples are going through in Mark. In terms of their understanding of Christ, their insight is starting to grow. It may take a few encounters with Christ, but eventually they see clearly as well. And so can we, if we, like his disciples, continue to depend on him. And we too can come to know Christ intimately if we continue to trust and follow him, even when times are hard. Now remember, The Gospel of Mark was written to Christians suffering persecution. They were experienced beatings and burnings and massacres. And Mark makes it very clear in the first part of his Gospel, Jesus is Lord even in the hard times. Fanny Crosby was only six weeks old when she developed a minor eye inflammation. It was a simple thing to treat even in 1820. That was the year she was born. All the doctor had to do was apply some ointment to her eyes with a little medication. Only the doctor that treated Fanny Crosby was careless. He put too much medication in the ointment. She went totally and permanently blind. Later in life, she said of the doctor, she said, if I could meet him now, I would say thank you, thank you over and over again for making me blind. It's because she saw her blindness as a gift from God. It's what, it's what helped her see Jesus in ways others seldom see him. For her blindness had given her spiritual insight that few people have ever had. And friends, that's what hard times can do for us. They can give us spiritual insight we've never had before. They can help us see Jesus like we've never seen him before. At first, things might be a little unclear like this guy. At first, we might not fully understand how Jesus can be God in the midst of our trials. But eventually, we'll see it if we stay close to him. You see, friends, the world is full of people who fail to believe anything about Jesus Christ. In this life that we live, we all have been guilty of failing to see something that's right before our eyes. All of us have family and friends that we cannot understand why they refuse to believe in God and accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. But we've got to be careful not to get frustrated and upset with those people. 
Remember, one of the great men of the Bible had a time of disbelief. Doubting Thomas, I talked earlier. Was a more, was a more unfair moniker ever pinned on a person? For by taking into account the full account of this first encounter with the risen Christ, Thomas could have easily been, been named Believing Thomas. For reasons we cannot presume to know, the resurrected Jesus first appeared to the disciples at a time when Thomas was absent. And hearing their claim to have seen Jesus alive, that's when Thomas didn't believe it. So he's labeled as a doubter because evidence was necessary to en enable and energize his belief that Jesus had indeed conquered death and vacated the tomb. The scriptures don't specifically detail the death of Thomas or the, the role of Thomas. But if you read history books, there's a third century theologian, Hippolytus, Hippolytus, I, I can't say his name, but he mentions that Thomas preached to the Parthians, the Medes, the Persians, and he was killed when a spear was put through his body at, at Kalmy in the city of India, and he was buried there. But he preached the gospel because he believed. Assuming this account to be factual, Thomas led souls to a saving faith in Christ. And we can do the same thing. We can do the same thing. Let me close my message this morning with this. Lee Strobel. Some of you have heard the name Lee Strobel. He wrote the book uh, Case for Christ. At one time was a devout atheist. He tells an amazing story of the famous, famous atheist, Charles Templeton. Templeton had not always been an atheist. In fact, he had been an evangelist working side by side with his close friend, Billy Graham. Before his conversion to Christ, he had been on the sports news writing staff of the Toronto Globe. And Templeton became disgusted with his lifestyle and one evening gave his life to Christ. And he wrote about the experience saying, an ineffable warmth began to come up on my body. It seemed that a light had turned on in my chest that had cleansed me. But unfortunately later, Templeton would abandon his faith and write a book entitled, Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. Then it was that Templeton uttered the words that Strobel never thought he would hear he never thought he would say no to Christ later on in life Templeton was dying from the incurable disease and Strobel went to see him and they talked about death and what was beyond and eventually they began to talk about the person of Jesus and Templeton's tone changed dramatically when Strobel asked him what he thought of Jesus that's a bold question. He looked at Strobel and he said he was the greatest human being who ever lived. He was a moral genius and Strobel was so surprised at these words and he replied, he said, you sound like you really still care about him. Temple said, I do. He's the most important thing in my life. I know it may sound strange, but I have to say I adore him. And Strobel again was a little shocked as he said, you say that with some emotion. He said, well, yes, everything good I know, everything decent I know, everything pure I know, I learned from Jesus Christ. And there was a brief pause, almost as if he was uncertain whether he should continue. Strobel writes these words. He says, Temple, Templeton went on, his, went on as he spoke slowly and deliberately. And he continued to talk about the importance of Jesus. Then it was when Templeton uttered the words that Strobel never thought he would hear. He says, and if I may put it this way, he said as his voice began to crack, I miss him. And tears came down Templeton's eyes. He said, I miss him. He turned his head and he looked downward, raising his left hand to shield his face from, from Strobel. And he sobbed and he sobbed. Friends, listen to what I'm telling you. Listen to what I'm telling you. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 45, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Jesus Christ is the pearl of great price. You 
you lose him, you lose everything. Those who fail to be persistent in their quest for Christ are robbed of God's greatest gift, and that's Jesus Christ himself. Those who fail to passionately quest for Christ, they settle for a life of begging for the meager things that the world has to offer, but they're never satisfied. Those who fail to pursue Christ end up following their own foolishness. And they miss out on the greatest gift of mankind. And that is salvation through Jesus Christ. Don't let go of that pearl. You can have that today. You can receive him as your Lord and Savior right here today. You can come down front and repent of your sins. Ask him into your heart. We'll have your sins washed in the waters of baptism today. It's urgent. Never promise tomorrow. Come today. Come just as you are.
technology is great when it works, but something messed up in my community meditation is about this big. <laughs> so we're going to have to play around a little bit. This morning I want to talk to you about the need for communion. And do you understand it? And do you understand the need? Christians call it by various names, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, and Communion. Churches celebrate it in various ways and times, and Christians even disagree about what it means to say Christ is present when we take the cup and the bread. But there are three truths about communion that we should all agree on. One is about the past, one is about the future, and one is about the present. The truth about the past is Jesus' sacrifice. When we take the Lord's Supper, we, we proclaim a truth about the past, that Jesus Christ sacrificed his, his life for our sins on the cross. And for Christians, the Lord's Supper is a celebration of a past event. The finished work of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, Jesus said when he gave the bread, this is my body. When he gave the cup, he said, this is my blood. He wanted his disciples to always remember that he had sacrificed his body and his blood on the cross for our salvation. And thus he told us, do this in remembrance of me. That's 1 Corinthians 11.25. A truth about the present is the church's fellowship. Jesus shared the bread with his disciples. And in Mark 14.23 it says, he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank it. It was an act of togetherness, fellowship, and that's why we call it communion. The truth about the future is the coming kingdom. In Mark 14, 25, we read the words, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Revelation 19, 9 calls this heavenly fellowship meal the wedding supper of the Lamb. For there, Jesus, the Lamb of God, will join with the church, the Bride of Christ, as we celebrate together for eternity. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are stating our belief in the coming of Christ's kingdom. <clears throat> in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11.26, it says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So during this time of communion, we proclaim a truth about the past by proclaiming the Lord's death. We proclaim a truth about the present by eating this bread and drinking of this cup. And we proclaim a truth about the future until he comes again. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, again, we just thank you for this opportunity, dear Lord, to, to serve you, to reflect, to live, to love, to be in your presence, dear Lord. We just ask that you be with us, that you allow us to worship you, and we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.
stand as we close with prayer. Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to come. All right, folks, I really enjoy this. Say it with me. Love God, love people, share Jesus. Have a great week, everybody.